Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Today, we're gonna to hear from two deeply committed New Yorkers who happen to be two of the most influential labor, le labor leaders in our city. George Gresham, president of 1199 SEIU, and our moderator, Kyle Bragg, president of 32BJ. The labor movement has a special place in our city's history. Unions built not only our roads, bridges, and buildings, they built our city's middle class. Their organizing and protest paved the way for a better New York, for a better life for so many New Yorkers. The labor movement ended the 60 hour work week, created safer working conditions, and has promoted social justice and equality in our city. As we think about the next phase of New York and how we can work to make our city more just, equitable and inclusive, there's a lot we can learn from our labor leaders. And I believe it is a partnership with labor that is essential, that is essential to our collective success. George Gresham is the president of 1199 SEIU. The union he leads represents more than 450,000 healthcare workers throughout the entire East Coast. In fact, 1199 SEIU is the largest and fastest growing healthcare union in the United States. Its members are true heroes, as we have all seen from the fight to save lives on the front lines of our city's response to this pandemic. Under his leadership, the union has secured the highest standards for healthcare workers in the nation, including fair wages, affordable health care benefits, retirement programs that allow his members to retire with dignity, continuing education, and funds for child care. 1199 is also among the most active unions fighting for social justice. The union has organized in solidarity with Black Lives Matter, the Black Lives Matter movement and has always fought for all workers. And they have a leader who knows firsthand the challenges that his members face and the opportunities that can change their lives. George began his career in the housekeeping department of a New York City hospital. He worked his way up the ladder, utilizing the 1199 training fund to help him pay tuition and living expenses so he could attend college and become a radio radiology technologist. That opportunity doubled his salary and set him on the way to becoming one of the most powerful voices in the labor movement. Over the decades, he has, over the decades, he has held nearly every position in 1199 including member delegate, organizer, VP, executive VP, secretary treasurer, and now president, the role he has held since 2007. And on the way up, he has always made sure to lift his members up with him. George, thank you for all you do to make it more fair and equitable in New York. We look forward to hearing from you in just a moment. It is also my pleasure to welcome our moderator today, another labor leader, and a huge important figure in our city, Kyle Bragg, the president of, of 32BJ. As president of 32BJ, he represents over 175,000 members in 11 states, making the organization the largest property service union, workers union in the country. His members are essential workers who have kept our buildings running and our city going to this pandemic. And they are lucky to have a leader like Kyle Bragg. Labor is in his DNA. His father was the vice president of 1199, SEIU, and he started organizing as a teacher, as a teenager. He has been a member of 32BJ for more than 35 years, where he worked greatly to expand the union. He led the merger with local 32E, bringing 9,000 Bronx and Westchester members into 32BJ, and as the secretary treasurer union, he grew the residential division to 35,000 members in the region. Working in lockstep with the late, great Hector Figueroa, who's a dear friend of ours, he helped 32BJ realize some of the biggest victories, such as unionizing airports and a $15 minimum wage. I also want to thank Kyle for his partnership with Abney on the census, something he, we started working on a few years ago. He has big shoes to fill in Heather, in, with Hector's passing, but under, under but the truth is he has done them and he's succeeded greatly for his union and for his members and for our city. I want to thank you both. I'm going to turn the Zoom over to you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, I appreciate very much for being invited to moderate this discussion with my big brother and my mentor and friend, uh, President George Gresham. Uh, I, before I begin uh, with some questions that I have to uh, present to uh, George, uh, I my, as you mentioned, my roots uh, run pretty deep with 1199. I've uh, grew up in that union. Uh, I'm as what they affectionately refer to as 1199 baby, 
which means that uh, you are uh, the child of a staff or a member who was uh, dragged into rallies and, dis and demonstrations as a child. And that pretty much was your childhood. Uh, when most kids were in the park, I was on uh, strike lines and, and, and rallies and demonstrations, fighting both for health care and for uh, social justice issues. So uh, my, my roots went deep with Love 99. That's why I'm so very excited to have the opportunity to uh, do this interview with my brother, uh, George. So I'm going to get started, because uh, I know that's what people want to hear from uh, Brother George. Uh, so George, throughout your career in the union, you have held nearly every possible position, starting in the housekeeping department at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital in Manhattan to, uh, today as president of 99 at CIU Healthcare Workers East. Uh, can you share with us your journey navigating power politics and racial justice? Sure. Thank you, Kyle. First of all, it's a pleasure to be with you here and the Association for Better New York. Thank you for putting on this forum. So that um, for me, <clears throat> as you mentioned in my biography, that I started out um, in Presbyterian Hospital in the housekeeping department. And the first thing that I remember was the experience that I had to show me the power of being a union member. You know, I, I grew up in the segregated South and my parents brought me back um, from the South to New York and live in New York. And yet I was tremendously um, influenced by the lack of power and disrespect that we had in the South. And so, in the housekeeping department, there came a time when there was going to be a layoff. And because I had a good amount of seniority because of the union, I applied for a clerk typist job, which I was absolutely qualified for. The union sent me for that interview. When I went on the interview, I looked a lot different than I do now. I had a really big Afro. I had an earring in my ear, and basically the department was all white department. And so when I went there, because that um, personnel had sent me over there, the supervisor at the time said to me that the chairman of the department was on vacation and that no one gets hired without that doctor's approval. And the whole time that she's talking to me, She's like staring at my ear with, with the earring. And so I said to myself, based on experiences I've had in the South, I'm not getting this job. And so I went back to the personnel department and told the personnel department what the response was from the supervisor. The director of personnel picked up the phone right in front of me and said to the supervisor, there is a union here now. You and the doctor, I don't want to mention his name, do not have a choice. And so I expect him to be at work on Monday. This was a Friday. I expect him to be at work on Monday. And that just amazed me. I'd never seen that I'd been so used to being discriminated or turned down. And that was the first reckoning of it. And as I, be, I became a delegate, and I think that my education as a delegate is what has led me through all that I've become within the organization. It has taught me the power to organize, the power to have people believe in themselves. You know, I go back to Leon Davis, who your father worked for, and I think of what a great organizer this man must have been because. He took a lot of union members. First of all, it was they, the pharmacists, that decided that they wanted to organize the service workers. And so their first plan was to meet with then Governor Nelson Rockefeller to get him to agree to give the rights for healthcare workers to organize, because prior to that, they did not have those rights. And then once he had the rights on law to organize, then he had to organize people. And 
he and along of a, a bunch of his organizers, and I'm sure at one point your father was a part, a part of that as a vice president, went into the shops and organized these majority women, majority women of color. Many of them at that point had been migrants from the South that had come out of segregation just like me that really honestly had no reason to trust white folks. And the fact that Leon Davis was willing to, able to get them to put their jobs on the line um, in order to improve their conditions when they had very little skills that that was the only way they had to feed their family. Not only that, um, Leon Davis, I'm sure your father told you, I don't know if you remember, had a very thick Yiddish accent. So it was even harder to understand him, yet he was able to communicate to these workers in a meaningful way that basically they decided to organize and believe in him and organize and build power. And, and that has always been a lesson for me within the labor movement is that our job is to give hope and direction to workers. And if you do that, it doesn't matter. We have a huge membership, as you know, in all of the regions of the states. But when I'm talking to whether it's our white members, our Latino members, our Haitian members, African-American members in the South, African-American members in the North, our Asian Pacific Islander members, it doesn't matter. They all want the same things for their family. And if you can get them to believe in that, they will do what is necessary so that that next generation can be better than themselves. And it's always been prideful for me because social justice has always been a part of the DNA of 1199. At the same time that Leon Davis was organizing the workers um, in the union, there was strife going on throughout the country around civil rights. It was in that same period. And he became very close associates with Dr. King, who actually six weeks before he died, called us his favorite union. He said that we are the authentic conscious of the labor movement and that we, to this day, try to live to that legacy. If Dr. King were alive today, would we still be his favorite union? That's amazing. Uh, people, you've already introduced yourself as a, as a, as a brother from the country. Uh, people, if you don't know, George is uh, just a country boy who has a propensity to use some cuss words on occasion. So, uh, so strap in. You might uh, get treated with some of that. Uh, I just want to do a little follow-up, George. Uh, how was your experience working through so many different roles at the union that formed your leadership for today? You know, I think that, you know, it has always gave me a view from a different perspective of the members. I think that the quality that the leadership of 1199 brings to the movement is that basically we were all, most of us were rank and followers ourselves. And that is an extremely important identity that we can always remain close to the members, that we keep our standards within those of the members. You know, Leon in the early days put something in the constitution that doesn't allow us to get paid higher than the highest paid member in the union. And that has always kept us grounded around the salaries, the working problems that people have on how to pay the bills. And don't get me wrong, I, I don't have a problem paying my bills. I'm blessed as a president of the union to make a good salary. But it's that identity, that rank and file identity that has helped me in, in all of the jobs that I have. And that's why when people are talking about my biography, they always have to include the fact that my first job was in housekeeping because people that are now doing their job have to understand that can be the beginning. It doesn't have to be the end and that we will fight to make sure that there's opportunities 
for everyone to grow within this organization and within society. Uh, I'm going to follow that up because as you're talking about uh, your member activists, your delegates, how very vital are they to the structure of the union as a whole? I mean, they, quite honestly, they are the union. That is the power of the union. If, if we don't have the delegate structure and in many other locals it's called shop steward, if we don't have the delegate structure, then we do not have the influence. We can't move the organization. You know, me sitting in my office or the vice presidents or the officers sitting in their office, we can have conversations, we can do brainstorming about what we think ought to be the, the, the way we ought to go to improve the life of our members. But we don't get to implement that. That is the actual delegate body. The closer you are to the membership, the more you understand what the needs are and what the concerns are. We can often hear it at 10,000 feet away um, from the problem. It is really that information and what, what we pride ourselves in 1199 is to make sure that there's always two-way communication. It's not just us telling the members or giving direction from the members, but also receiving directions from them so that we can move in unison. Um, we, you know, a long time we've had a saying in our union that whatever the issue is, if it divides us, it's not good. If it unites us, it is good. And sometimes there are issues that are controversial that we have to take the time and explain to the workers why this is important. Quite often it's how do we bring another group of people out of the darkness into the mainstream of society so that we can all live in a just society. But it is absolutely the structure of the membership and the activism of the membership that keeps us strong. Uh, while we're on the membership, we, you and I both have a very diverse membership. Uh, and 1199 has several caucuses that reflect and celebrate that diversity and rich richness of diversity of your union, which at the same time often represents the under, underserved populations in our city. So how do the union caucuses further support workers in your union and in the communities that they live? Yes, on, on, a, on a personal note, I, I'm gonna take great pride in this because it was I that went to the executive committee and talked about the need to have caucuses officially that they should not be an underground organization without, within our union, but in fact, a way, another way that people, one, can celebrate the diversity of each other, learn more about the diversity of each other, and also organize around the needs and the concerns that they may have. You know, we, we have to be more than just about salary and benefits. We have to understand the other socioeconomic issues that people go through. And, the, and quite often, the support that they feel is when they have that identity. You know, just on a cultural fun part of it, it's so nice. We basically put, participate in a lot of parades that celebrate the culture and diversity of the union. And I've always tried to make myself present to be there with them. And it's such a beautiful thing when you see members wearing their 1199 t-shirts and identity, but also celebrating their culture and feeling that that party is, that family is a much larger piece than just that individual. And so we have caucuses um, around the union and we make sure that we are in touch with them, that they get a chance to have voices and grow and we support them financially in a way that allows them to think beyond that capacity. And I think it is just, it is appropriate that we celebrate the diversity of our organization by recognizing and officially giving voice to that diversity. George, I've always been very impressed with the activism of your retirees. 
Love and 99 is a vibrant and very active retiree base. How does that you how does the union keep in touch with its retirees and engage them in advocacy campaigns after they have left their day jobs? Yeah, you know, we, they 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 wear t-shirts quite often retired but active. And matter of fact, a lot of these retirees are people that learned it from your father and other leaders in the union and they don't let that activism go. We have, when you go to south of the Mason-Dixon line, we have a huge amount of retirees in every state. And when it comes to getting out the vote, when it comes to fighting and supporting for the contract, they absolutely are active. I mean, mm -hmm. retirees are not, it's hard to keep up with them sometimes. The amount of work that we have, we have a, annual um prior to COVID, we had an annual um luncheon in oh. florida with our members oh, yeah. that is the area where we have the, the largest amount of retirees they and they're mostly all of them are retired new yorkers that then went to live the good life in florida and we've had to change hotels on several times because the capacity is just too small for them. And I remember back in um, 2008, and this is during the presidential primary, and at the time, the top two candidates were Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. And I was addressing the retirees, and I asked by a show of hands how many people thought Hillary Clinton would be the best candidate for president, half the room raised their hand. This is like about almost 4,000 people in the room. And then I asked how many thought Barack Obama would be the best candidate. The other half of the room raised their hand. And then I said, well, how many believe that either one of them would make a much better president than the current president we have now? Everyone was there on that, and that's and we got united around that. We came into a solidarity pledge that whomever it was that would end up with the support that they would have support. But they they knock on homes, they canvass, mm -hmm. they make phone calls. They they get offended if we don't include them in the struggle and into the fight. And so I just look at them as hopefully one day my future division and hope that I have the energy and stamina that they have. Um, but they're a very important unit of our organization. They have a seat on our executive board and everything that we do basically is supported by that retiree division. That's great. Um, George, your membership works in home care, nursing homes, hospitals, and clinics. Roles we now identify as our frontline heroes as a result of their drive, their dedication, their fearlessness in the face of COVID-19. What role did the union have in keeping its members safe during this crisis? Yeah, I have to tell you, um, it's a horrible experience that we all went through, to be quite honest. It was very sad in the beginning because as you've probably heard on television, the issues around PPEs was so sad. We had members that couldn't get gowns and would wear garbage bags, plastic garbage bags in order to protect them. Sad stories about people that had to wash their mask, their one mask, in order to use it to get it through the week. Um, in most cases wasn't because the employer was denying them that it was because they could not get the supplies around it to be quite honest with you and it hurt me it bothered me because you almost got one of those words from me but the knucklehead in dc that did not take this covid virus seriously got us off to a really bad stop uh, start in fighting this pandemic to the point that the precious weeks that were lost in denial as this became a global pandemic 
many of the other countries were basically grabbing those supplies, whether it was respirators, whether it was face mm -hmm. masks. And by the time we started getting in line for that, we had to wait because production could not keep up with the need for that. And, and so we fought as much as we could to constantly getting the PPE so that workers could come out and do their commitment. I have to say that my heart went out to them as a former healthcare worker to know how scary it must have been to go out and fight against this invisible enemy, hoping one that you're able to fulfill your commitment and providing good quality care, but at the same time that you don't bring something home to your family or that you're able to come home every day um, as a survival in this. And it was particularly scary. And we had numerous town hall meetings that we did with the membership. We had um, set up special online um, information that people could call in, ask any question that we had. We had doctors, we had elected officials join the membership to be able to answer any questions that they had. We also, um, in, in all of our states, did caravans that we would um, go around, we would play music, we would salute the workers to lift up their spirits, to let them know that they were not in this alone. And, and by the way, our members in Florida, as you know, are still going through that on a daily basis in that hot zone. And it's just, um, it's just un unbelievably courageous of them. Many of them um, in, in Florida, because it's a right to work state, do not have the resources. We haven't been able to get the resources that, as you can imagine, a hospital in New York City would provide because of the resources and the union density that we have to enforce that kind of strength. And still, there's a real concern about a possible resurgence of this pandemic. And people, a matter of fact, this week I'm doing a town hall meeting with just our Florida membership and prior to that with the Florida staff because they're worn down, they're tired. Mm -hmm. They just don't have the energy. They know what they need to do. But it's been months now of fighting this invisible enemy and we just have to do all that we can to thank them because they have helped to flatten the curve for all of us to breathe a little easier. And while we are still as a society working virtually because of the threat that this pandemic causes. Without their heroism, we'd be in a much worse condition than we are. Yeah, I clearly relate to that struggle and that fight uh, representing uh, essential workers who've been on the front lines as well. You know, residential workers, security officers, airport workers, uh, you know, having to fight early on for PPE. So we understand that struggle, but. Uh, it, the struggle was so real with, with uh, healthcare workers around the country, particularly across the East Coast as well. We know how hard New York and Florida continues to be here. So I, I stand to support with you there. So behind the scenes, George, how was the pandemic upended collective bargaining? How does race impact the process at the bargaining table? Can you talk to us a well, little bit about that? You know, the truth is that as horrible as the pandemic is, and I can't remember anything more, more horrible in my lifetime on this planet, but as horrible as it is, it also told some truths that people could no longer ignore. The disparity within the communities of color and the underserved became extremely obvious when you look at the fatalities, when you look at the hospitalizations and the people the outcomes of that, not only because it hit our community so hard, but because of the fact that within communities of color, 
we were not getting good quality care. And so we were also the ones that had the underlying ailments that therefore made it even more difficult to survive this pandemic. And while many of us knew this before, that people of color and the underserved communities did not have the good quality, decent maintenance healthcare that they deserve to keep them healthy, nor that they have the nutrition within their diet to keep them happy, um, healthy, nor that they have the economic support um, that allow them to, to stay healthy. When the pandemic came, it exposed all of that. Um, in a very negative way when you began to look at the body count and the numbers, but it made it extremely obvious of the discrimination and the disparity that goes on in this country. I also have to believe that the George Floyd incident is not the first time that this has happened in society right here in New York. We had Eric Garner, and basically saying the same words, whether it was being choked to death or a knee on, the, on the, the neck, it still was the same thing. But because people were quarantined, I believe, and because people had been realizing now of watching family members die, watching the disparities that existed around the pandemic, it, was, it became intolerable. It became too obvious. And it, it awakened to me in a way that I hadn't seen since my parents brought me from the South in the 60s and seeing that kind of uprising. And so that I, I can't imagine saying that there was something great that came out of the pandemic, but it did make it harder to ignore the things that currently exist as a result of this pandemic. Uh, George, unions have a strong history rooted in political action. And for 1199 in particular, this is because the healthcare industry is regulated by the government and the majority of healthcare funding comes from Medicare and Medicaid. So how has 1199 been successful in mobilizing broad public support beyond this membership? And how can we apply those principles to taking action for social justice today? Yeah, you know, one of the things that, one of the early lessons that we learned in the union was, like I said, the power of politics and the power of the union that they had. That goes back, again, to Leon Davis, who went to the governor, Nelson Rockefeller, to get the right to organize workers. And we've always known, particularly, as you said, that healthcare is so um legislated that if you're not in the game of politics, then you have no way to really support the members. And so that one, we have a political action fund that members voluntarily sign up for and donate their money on their own. And you you would, it's, it's hard to believe that some of our um, lower paid workers give the greatest amount of their salary to that political action. This is, for them, this is the difference between life and death for them. This, this is something that they believe is worth putting their money into. And so we have the largest political action fund, it's called the Dr. Martin Luther King Political Action Fund in the country because workers give us that money and we take that money very seriously. We use that money to advance the interests of our members by the ability to organize by whom we support. We have a saying, we know that we didn't in invent it, but we know it's our mantra. And that is that we don't have permanent interests or friends, excuse me, we don't have permanent enemies or friends but we have permanent interests. And that's how we decide how we spend those resources. Not only that, the ability to get the workers to organize, to come out and work for us, to canvas when we need to mobilize folks. You would think we were giving away 
a free home, the way people line up to get on those buses, to raise their voices, to let that be heard. Something that is not unnoticed by the elected officials. And so that politics is something that we are proud of the fact that our members have a great awareness of the power of politics and how involved that they continue to be around that. As a matter of fact, because we're in this virtual environment, they're very antsy. As we get up to this presidential season right now, they're so used to being out there canvassing, poll watching, oh, doing like all it. that they can to do to get, and, and they, so we're learning a new technology and new way of doing it, um, which again, one could say is a benefit of dealing in this environment that we now have to learn how to do things virtually. And quite honestly, some of this stuff, I hope we maintain that we don't always go back to the new way, but our, our members thirst for, for politics is something you would say insatiable the way that they always want to get involved. And, and that's a blessing for all of us, to be quite honest. George, one of the current campaigns, 1199, uh, concerns the 2020 census. We care, yeah. we count. Uh, the union seeks all New Yorkers to be counted, an effort that Abney and we at 32BJ know very well. How have you galvanized membership behind this effort, even though some of may be fearful or even wary of completing government forms due to their legal status or privacy concerns? Yeah, that is something that we addressed early prior to um, this pandemic. We had that conversation because when you look at the Trump administration, it is no wonder why people would be concerned um, based on their status to fill out these forms. It, it is a real worry, it's a real understanding that some people would be intimidated to fill out this form as the way they saw that they were being treated yeah. and others were being treated by the federal government. And the first thing we had to do was to really assure them based on their confidence in the union that in fact, that this was a safe thing to do and that they wouldn't see their families broken up as a result of filling out these forms, how important it would be that the resources for the next 10 years really depended on the ability for them to fill out this form. And I think we were really starting to make headway. I have to tell you that some of that dropped off as this pandemic um, became more and more um, the story of the day and the worry of the day. And um, once, so there, quite honestly, there, there was a period of a month or two when people thought we were losing our mind to talk to them about the census rather than talking to them about COVID-19. And thank, thank God that we can now get their attention again and continue to push on this. The last thing that we needed was for the federal government to shorten the time for the census rather than lengthen the time for the, but we use that as an educational point as well. Mm -hmm. This is the representation that you get when you don't fill out the census and make sure that you're letting your voice be heard so that we are using all of our media, our social media, social media, all of the communication devices that we have to remind our members, but not only our members, but also to go to whatever their um, spheres of influence that they may have, whether it's in, within the church, within the neighborhood, within the family, that basically just let people know if you haven't filled out your senses, then you don't have the right to complain in the future about lack of rep representation. And so we're trying to amplify that voice as much as we can around the census. And I wanna thank you and the Association for Better New York for making this a priority project because it is. Thank you, George. Uh, like like uh, 
32BJ, you oversee membership in several states in Washington, D.C., and have members in these various regions reacted uh, to the twin crisis of, of the pandemic and social economic unrest. It'd be interesting to hear from you on that. Yeah, you know, like I said earlier, it really doesn't matter where our members are or what their demographics are, to be quite honest. They all want the same thing. They don't all have the same conditions. As one can imagine that we have the healthiest um, collective bargaining right here in New York City, where some of the most wealthy hospitals and institutions are, but not only because of that, because our wealthiest hospital, um, unfortunately, the members do not have the best conditions, and that is the HCA hospitals in Florida. So it's not just about the resources, it's about the union density that we have in New York that can make a difference. Mm -hmm. But um, all in, in all of these places, that the issues around organizing, the issues around strength, is something that people continue to fight. I remember when I first became the president of, of 1199 and working very hard with my mentor, Dennis Rivera. And the first thing I had been elected as president, but I hadn't been sworn in as president. And I was asked to give a speech at the John F. Kennedy um, Library in Massachusetts. And being prepped for that, speech, um, I was told that it would be a very progressive, I was very comfortable with that. It would be majority white audience. I was less comfortable with that. Um, and that I, I went there to give a speech. And when I began to give the speech, luckily for me, the program was starting to run over time. And so as the keynote speaker, I knew that my t I wasn't going to keep their attention that long because it had been a really long meeting. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I did was take the speech that I had and tore it up in front of them. And I know that made them happy. But it allowed me to speak from my heart. Yeah. And I spoke from my heart yes. about what working people want in this country. And... I actually got like five standing ovations from that. And after that, I was never intimidated by the constituency of the audience anymore because it doesn't matter who you're speaking for. We all want the same things for our family. And if you can hit that note, people are ready to support that and do what is ne necessary. And I'm hoping that that energy carries throughout this election period because people do realize and starting to see that the next generation, unless we change things, is not gonna not only not do better than this generation, but not have the opportunities that we have at this point. Um, all of us wasn't born with a not only silver, but platinum spoon. And so therefore we have to think about what are the working class needs are. And I find that to be prevalent no matter where we are within our union. Well, thank you for that, George. I heard you speak several occasions and when you speak from your heart, it really resonates with the, whatever audience is in front of you. you have both your experience uh, and both your work experience and your life experience uh, speaks to truth and power. And that resonates with everyone who wants to hear the truth. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, in 2016, you were in the chair of the governor's initiative. You were the chair of the governor's initiative, the Mario Cuomo Campaign for Economic Justice, which led to the passage of the fight of 15 minimum wage, which uh, uh, still is amazing to me how uh, that, that campaign uh, was won. How significant was that uh, at the moment? Man, yeah, no, no, that was extremely significant. And I'll be honest with you, um, it's kind of fun um, because while the stakes were high at what we wanted to do, I felt like the issue was the kind that if given an opportunity to speak to people, and I'm talking about elected officials that had the ability 
to vote this up or down, that if you make the case about the realism of $15 an hour, that wasn't going to make anybody rich, but maybe allow them to have a quality edu um, life with their family. Maybe they can drop that third job that they have so they can spend more time with their family. And so that, you know, we got into an RV, me and the governor, and rode around the state, you know, at these different checkpoints. And, I heard um, that story. <laughs> man, a little too many donuts and coffee <laughs> during that period of time. But to at every stop, and there was diversity in a lot of the stops. What what the stops in 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 the lower part of the state did not look the same as the stops in up in New York or in Western New York. But yet the message was always the same. And to be quite honest with you, it had a tremendous effect on workers like our home care workers, some of our lower paid nursing home workers, that now they could get a guaranteed $15 an hour minimum. And I know it was you and your predecessor, Hector, and our international that made that $15 an hour uh, uh, absolutely stipulation that you began to hear more and more elected officials talk about the need to have $15 an hour. And we carried that even into um, Baltimore, Maryland, where we we're in negotiations with a name that people know very well, Johns Hopkins. And while we do not have a huge membership, and basically we only represent the service workers in there, we use that $15 an hour mantra as a way to build momentum. And we got, we got students involved. We got a lot of actors that came out of Baltimore, Wendell Pierce. We got Danny Glover to all come and join in that idea that $15 an hour people needed to make a decent, a decent living to take care of their families. One of the sad stories that we, you know, I wouldn't say we exported, but we certainly communicated it, was that we had one of our workers in Baltimore working every day full time. And when it was time to go home, she went to a homeless shelter because she could not afford housing, working hard every day. And we began to tell those stories. And so both in New York, traveling around with that campaign and then building around that momentum in other areas to let other workers know that this is not something unreasonable, it's something that you deserve. So it had a tremendous effect. Um, it was fun, but it was very important at the same time. Uh, I, I knew this, and a lot of people didn't know the great sacrifices that you made and committed to to, to get that uh, passed. Uh, and the governor always speaks very fondly of those, of those times, but also the degree of, of, of difficulty that it required to travel by caravan across the state. But uh, he said to me that he would never have been able to do it without uh, having you there with him. So. As we all thank you both for your sacrifice. You. Uh, another vital part of the union's membership is, to expose, is the exposure to job training and continued education, which is important uh, as for us as well. What sorts of programs does Love 99 have in place to support the membership in a global economy where the nature of work is constantly evolving? Yeah, we, you know, I'm, I'm, as it was said in my biography, that I took advantage of the training and upgrading fund that we had, which is something that is very significant to me because it gives adults who life's responsibility did not allow them to necessarily finish school at the time when they would like to, it gives them a second chance, a chance to make a greater contribution to healthcare by going up a career ladder and developing a career ladder. Um, and I'm one, of the, I'm one of the recipients of that. I was able to get a scholarship stipend um, 
as a result of that training and upgrading fund and go back and finish my education and really change my lifestyle as far as my ability to take care of my family. As a matter of fact, I decided to have more children as a result of that because I could afford them at that point. And that training and upgrading fund is something that we are working to make sure that the jobs of the future are available. A lot of our workers right now are in jobs that basically does not have a future in it, to be quite honest with you. And one of the things that we have in our job fund is um, a job security fund, where if people are laid off for whatever reason in their job, that they, um, one, continue to get their medical benefits taken care of, they get a stipend um, so that they can continue to take care of their family. But the big jewel of that is that they can get trained for new jobs in the future, trained to have jobs, um, skill training that they didn't necessarily get before. Mm -hmm. and, and that is something that has given so much pride to our workers. If you, if you look at the, um, if you were able to turn into the convention last year, the Democratic convention last week rather, and when you saw the New York delegation do the roll call, yeah. you saw a registered nurse, 1199 yeah. member, proud 1199 member, who, um, the story that wasn't told is that she's a proud participant in our training and upgrading fund. Wow. She went from getting a GED to getting an associate's to getting a bachelorate wow. at an RN. And now, in a few more months, we'll be calling her Dr. Sheena because she's finished. She's about to finish her PhD program. And those are the opportunities that we want to give to all our members that um, don't let life circumstances choose where you end up in life, but given the opportunity, we all want to do better. People oftentimes get judged by where they start. And I tell the members all the time, it's not where you start, it's where you end up. That's and right. we're going to try our best to make sure that if you have the desire, that the support and the resources are there when you take this life wherever you want to go. So I'll, I'll be honest, one of my favorite ceremonies to go to is the annual training oh, yeah. and upgrading ceremony right. where we have thousands of members that either went from to get their GED to people that went for their PhD mm -hmm. and have now um, quenched the thirst for learning and have the the confidence as an adult to continue to strive and do that. So I take a lot of pride in that, not only because I'm a, I'm a graduate of that program myself, but the meaningful way in which it gets to change people's lives. Absolutely. Uh, we're running close to the end. So what I would like to do now is uh, take, we have a couple of questions from some uh, audience participants, and I'll start with someone who we both know very well, a young activist, uh, Brother Marvin Bain. In the era of COVID, how do you both plan to engage young members through a cultural perspective? Shout out to you, Marvin, and graduate of the Bill Lynch Academy, um, who was also a me another mentor of mine for certain. I miss him every day. Yes. But we we um with we, virtually i mean that's what we have to do we have to take technology and we are having meeting teams meetings zoom meetings teleconference meetings with our members we're making sure that while we as staff many of us are working remotely it's important that the workers don't feel remote from the union that in fact, they did feel that the support is there and that they're only one phone call or one Zoom meeting away from getting the support that they need. That's very important. And it, is, it has taught us to use the technology that quite often was available to us before, but we were so comfortable 
with our in-person meeting that we did not do the paradigm shift that we were forced to do when we had to communicate virtually. So again, something that one might say was positive that came out of this pandemic is our ability to use our smartphones in a smart way. Because starting with me, even though my job, when I left the institution was an MRI technologist, and that was basically totally computer oriented, that I had fell behind. And I remember talking to one of our um, IT people and said, listen, don't give me a smartphone, give me a dumb phone, because I'm not utilizing all of the skills and applications that I know is available. But we have learned to do that with making sure that our members do that as well, so that that is the wave of the future. I'm gonna leave that response to George uh, because we're almost out of time in order to get in one more question from the uh, audience. And this one is from uh, a friend of mine and George, uh, Brother Justice from uh, Local 79, the laborers. Uh, laborers Local 79 is arguably the most diverse and inclusive construction union in the city. But we are the most attacked by union buses. How can we get help from non-constructing progressive unions? Well, I think, you know, for me, the, the ability is to, one, let us, let us know this, to be quite honest with you. I would say, I'll speak for, for my union, that we have a tremendous uh, political director. Her name is Gabby C.A. We have um, strong communications, Cara Noel. And, and my, my chief of staff, Deborah Pucci, and my executive assistant, Andrea Saunders, if you reach out to any of them, um, they will follow up with how many ways that we can be helpful. You know, we, we have a solidarity fund. We know that we can't feed the world but we can help to teach the world on how to feed the world and be supportive to whatever degree. We want to grow um, the ability for working people to have a voice in this country. We don't want to be an island by ourselves. That is of no value. That if we don't change society and grow society as we grow our union, then we'll never get to that point where we all will be supportive. And so, we love working with progressive organizations to the ability that we can to build a greater union unity in this world. Well, thank you, George. I thank you for your time and, and thank you for joining us today. I want to thank Steve Rubenstein and Association for Better New York, uh, Melvin Miller, the director, for having this uh, discussion with you. And I'm going to turn it back over to Steve. Thank Peace you. And blessings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you for this conversation. It was fascinating and important. George, you said it is not where you start, but it is where you end up. Those are powerful words, and we all have a road ahead of us as we come out and recover from this pandemic. And I think we look forward to the partnership. We us all doing things together to make our city stronger. I also believe for your incredible advocacy for your members and giving them dignity the wages and the things they deserve. We're all in this together, and I look forward to doing, doing more together in the future. So thank you both for what you shared with us. And everybody be well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.